open with me to uh, Acts chapter 4. I will ask you to stand for the reading of the scriptures. Acts chapter 4, verse 23. Shall we stand for the reading of the scriptures? Acts chapter 4, beginning with verse 23. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and their elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage? Their people plot in vain and the kings of the earth take their stand. The rulers to gather together against the Lord and against the anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate meet together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed. They did, what you, they did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats. Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness, stretch out your hand to heal, and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. All the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed any of their possessions with their, was his own, but they shared everything they had with great power. The apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the, Lord, of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. There was no needy persons among them, for from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from their cells and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. A man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property with his wife full, full knowledge. He kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest up and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept yourself some of the money you received from the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, was in the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men but to God. When Ananias, Ananias heard this, he fell down and died, and great fear seized all who heard what happened? Then the young men came and come forward, wrapped his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, this, is this the price you and Ananias got for the, for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they will call you out also. And that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, finding her dead, carried her out, buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Lord, we pray that you will speak to us in the preaching of your word. Let your word uh, build us up for our own journey of faith in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The title for our sermon is Together for the Gospel. And I have four things to highlight from uh, this long text. There are many things to, 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 to talk about, but I really, in our theme of togetherness, I like to highlight that together in our heritage, together in prayer, together in generosity, and then fourth, separated by pretense. Those are the four things I would like us to highlight. Now, uh, for some reason, one of the emphases of the, of the New Testament is a church that God has designed as a body where people grow and walk and serve together. And there are many images of that in the early church. And in our particular text, we find that as a part of the image 
and, and, and it begins by highlighting the fact that we're not just together in, uh, 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 in, in presence, but we are together in our heritage. You see, in verse 24, he says, Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Verse 25, you spoke by the spirit of the mouth of your servant, our father David. Generations after David see themselves as descendant of David. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant David, whom you anointed. They see Jesus as the fulfillment of the prophecy for God's people. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and never your servant to speak your word with great boldness. Again, they see this as a fulfillment of what God has told before. They saw themselves as a people with a common heritage, a common history, and a common promise. You and I are part of the story of Adam, of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, and the promises of the, their promises, are, are, you, are, you and I are part of the promises made to God, by God to his people. We see this thread carried through many passages in Acts. In chapter 2, verse 29, Brothers, I tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried in his tomb uh, is here today. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on earth that he would place on his descendants, one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did they but the seed decay. In other words, uh, 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 Peter, speaking uh, in the sermon in chapter 2, again sees Jesus as a fulfillment of, of what was spoken long ago uh, as, as a part of, of a, a descendant of a patriarch, David. Again, uh, uh, part of a long lineage of God's people and God's promises for his people. In chapter 3, Verse 25 and 26. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with his fathers, he said to Abraham, through your offerings, all the people of the earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. A part of what Peter is highlighting to the people is a part of a long heritage, part of a, of a promise made ages before. And our father, David, is, is part of a promise given way, way before. And, 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 and you and I are part of this heritage as a people who have come to faith. We are people of promise. You and I would not would be called, considered Gentiles, people who are not part of pro promises of God's people. But through Jesus Christ, we have become a people of a promise. We have become a part of the heritage of God's people. This is what makes you my sister. This is what makes you my brother. Which means, I don't give up on you, you don't give up on me. Which means that we, 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 we understand that as a, a fellowship of believers, there's a brotherhood that has become a part of our lives. Which uh, I, I usually tell the, uh, the, the ladies in Uganda service, in our first service, uh, the, when they greet me, they're always trying to kneel. <laughs> And I tell them, Bambi, Tomufu Kambira, and Dimusumba Mawanga Magate. Because I, 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 there's a, a multicultural presence in Kampala Baptist Church, and, and, and I just find fun, it funny for them kneeling for me. I don't want that pressure on the others that don't come from that culture. 
I probably told you this story before, uh, uh, that my father was sick at, uh, at Malago Hospital. And I went to see him one day with a Congolese guy. And then the next day, I went to see him with Esther Tushabe, who's a Mnyankode. And then another day, I, I, I went to see him with uh, somebody from, uh, from Lira. And then he says, the next day I went there alone, and he said, uh, where do you get all those, uh, huh, how do you even translate that? How do you get all those uh, uh, tribes? What he, he didn't understand is because of my relationship with Christ, I have brothers and st sisters across the tribes. It, it, the, the tribal lines become vague because of the blood of Christ that has drawn me uh, into brotherhood with, with, uh, across nations, across tribes. And you and I have become a part of this common heritage. Therefore, we have to build our relationships with, beyond our tribal uh, 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 lines. We have to appreciate the diversity that God has placed in the fellowship of believers. And because we're different Come, have a different uh, history sometimes, we can be a little different from one another in the way we perceive things, in the, in the culture details, but in Christ, we are part of the common heritage. And we have to, uh, to leave that out in the fellowship of believers. The second thing that we see in our text uh, is, is that we're together in prayer. And, and that there's power when believers understand what this should look like. When they heard this uh, verse 24, they raised their voices uh, in prayer to God, Sovereign Lord, they said. In verse 31, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. You see, Power is released from heaven when the children of God agree about something and raise their voices to God in prayer. Please notice that one of the components of prayer that is missing more and more in today's prayer is the, the idea that we agree. You find many churches prayer meetings where everybody is screaming on his own at the top of their lungs. The promise in Matthew 18, 19 says, again I tell you, if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where or two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. That God promises a people who come together in agreement. He promises answered prayer, but he also promises presence. I am there with them. There's power in, in the fellowship of believers that agree on God's direction for their lives, on God's plan for their life, or agree on, on how to think about a, a given issue and is presented to God, there's power released in prayer when believers come together for, uh, to pray. Together in our heritage, together in prayer, but together in generosity. You see, the text says all the believers were in one heart, one heart, rather one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. There was no needy persons among them, for from time to time, those who owned land and houses sold them, brought the money from the cells and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. 
Joseph a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Bar Barnabas, which means sons of encourage, son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. What does this mean? How is, does one leave that out? Now, there are some churches that take this text and tell their members, <laughs> go sell your land and bring it at the apostles' feet. <laughs> I don't know how many of you would, uh, would respond to that uh, <laughs> voice if I told you God has just told me you go sell what your property and bring it at the apostles' feet. Please read in Acts. There are churches or leaders who have used this text to literally rob stuff out of people, uh, from people. But the, the principle here okay, in fact there are also fellowships where uh, People have chosen common ownership. But the principle here is that you and I are brothers and sisters. Your needs are part of my story. My, my resources are part of your story. That we, sh we have, because we are brothers and sisters, we, we, we are concerned about each other's needs. Now, of course... This is in this, the context of the whole teaching of Scripture uh, because, uh, again, in a fellowship of believers, usually there are those people who don't want to work. Monday to Sunday, they do nothing, and then they expect somebody else to take care of, of them because we are brothers. There's, the, the Apostle Paul tells us that those who don't work should not even eat. So it is not this place where some people, it's not a, a design where people do nothing and reap from others. It is a call for us to be, uh, to be concerned about each other's needs, to be in a fellowship where there's generosity for one another. That's the picture that we see in the early church. You see, when we understand we have a common heritage, when we understand that we are together, when we live together in, in prayer, the inevitable response is generosity. Your problems becomes, uh, become my, mine and your joys become shared joys. Now, this is a beautiful picture. You read this picture in Acts 4, beautiful picture where believers are walking together and suddenly this is invaded by pretense. By the desire to show. By the walking away from authenticity where believers stop being authentic. It is one of the was one of the problems of the other church. This continues to be one of the problems of the church where people are not authentic. The man you meet at the church and the man you meet in the community are not the same. So there was a man called Ananias. Ananias is part of a fellowship where people are selling their fields and bringing their money at the apostles' feet. I don't know whether when they, they, money, when they would bring the money at the apostles' feet and they would be Obugaro. I don't know what motivates Ananias and Sapphira. They go, they sell their field. They bring the money at their feet, apostles' feet, but they don't bring everything. But they, but they pretend that they brought everything. And so Peter asks, why has Satan filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and kept for yourself some of the money you received for the field? Do 
Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? You know, was there any pressure for you to sell? And after you sold, was there the money at your disposal? Why did you want to, 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 to pretend that you've given everything when that is not true? The text tells us that when Ananias had this, he fell down and died. So they carried him and buried him. Then the wife walks in three hours later. I still don't know how it happened that they buried the husband without her knowledge. But anyway, I am not sure about the context of the culture. But what, what the text tells us, three hours later, the wife walks in and she has, has, has no idea that the, the husband has lied and died. They ask her, did you, is this what you sold? Is that the price? And she said, yes. And they ask her the, question, the same question. How could you conspire to test the spirit? Which means husband and wife had agreed, we are going to sell, we are going to keep some, and we are going to say, we've given everything. The feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. So, or, and at that moment she fell down at his feet and died. I was actually thinking about this. They did not even get the opportunity to enjoy the money they had lied about. They're gone. <laughs> if the Holy Spirit chose to do this at Kampala Baptist Church, uh, and, and the way we live in our relationships, I don't know how many would survive. Because you see, dishonesty and lying has, has become so pers pervasive in the church. Somebody calls you and says, where are you? And you're still at the taxi park. Why should you tell them I'm here at the full gospel? Why? If you tell them I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm running late, I'm, at the, I'm still at the taxi park, what are they going to do to that? Are they going to beat you? Huh? You know, you owe somebody money and and you promise them, tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock, I'll have your money. And you know that that's just a, a line. Why? But lies have become so, such a common thing. <laughs> and here, God dealt with it decisively. Wow. Why? Because it, the, it, it breaks down this togetherness. You read John 17, and you see that Jesus in this, in the agony, in this prayer in which he agonized before the presence of God, one of the, the themes repeated over and over in Jesus' prayer is that the God's people would be one. Because when they are one, the gospel thrives. When they are, they are divided, the gospel struggles. And lying was a key enemy of this unity. Now this week, I had a test about this lying. We needed to, do, to meet somebody uh, uh, at uh, Mengo Hospital on uh, Monday, 
I think Monday morning. So I drove through the main gate. We got whatever business that took us there sorted. And I chose to drive through the back gate, which they try not to, to get you to drive out of there because they're trying to get you to pay. So I get to the gate, and there are two cars behind me. And the security guard asks me, are you staff? And if I said, yes, I am staff, they would just open the door and I drive through. If I said I am not staff, they'll make me turn around and go back and use the main gate. <laughs> uh, so I said, no, I am not staff. That meant I had to drive out because there was no way to turn and drive back to go to the main gate. And that's what I did. And uh, because I had been studying this text, I'm thinking, wow, this was a test of the text I'm studying. And so I survived, thank God. But you and I find those daily moments in our life where the truth is clear, but the lie is inviting. And God dealt this with this lie so decisively because at the core of, 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 of believers working together and doing ministry together must be truth. When it is not there, it, it takes away from togetherness. Because as the the Baganda say, Agali awamu gegaluma enyama. When the teeth are together, they can bite into meat. I just remember as a young boy, my grandmother loved roasted meat. And every time they bought meat, particularly on Fridays, there was usually a market, a big market on Friday, and there would be our cows would be slaughtered and they would always bring meat home and my grandmother would always say and they would always they would, they would do like roasted meat but as she grew older she lost one teeth after another in her older age she would crave the meat that she couldn't quite eat because there were no teeth to chew the meat Because for the teeth to chew the meat, they need to be together. They are not scattered. They don't do the job. And, and it, there's something true about that picture for the children of God, for the church of Christ. The church of Christ loses its effectiveness if there's not togetherness. I believe that's why one of the reasons that the God of truth dealt decisively with the lies brought into this picture by Ananias and Sapphira. So today, just to remind you, we are together in our heritage, brothers and sisters. To remind you, together in prayer, we must find opportunities where we come together and pray in agreement. And three, we must be a church where we care for one another. And then, when that happens, as we come to get together in prayer, the gates of hell will be shaken. When the believers came together, the whole place was shaking. There was a presence of God's power as God's people came together with a common purpose and, and sought his face. The, the, their world was not the same. We are told oh, oh, in, people were getting served in, with, in thousands because God's people were coming together in agreement, in prayer, and in generosity with one another. I pray that this week 
you'll find the opportunities to walk with others, to celebrate our common heritage, and to, to, to come in prayer with other believers so that we together can invade the guests of hell so that we can draw people into the gates of heaven. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will cause us to be a church, of, a, a, a church, a people that walk together for the gospel. Just as we see this power expressed in the early church, we pray that you will help us to be a people who are truthful to one another so that your spirit will move freely in our midst. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.